Barry. Welcome to Educate, Inform, and Challenge. My name is Teresa McLennan, uh, Executive Director of the Women and Children's Shelter of Barrie. We are so thankful that you have joined us today, and we hope that this will be uh, an episode where we learn more about work that's being done in our community. As you know, the goal of our program is to talk about the lives and experiences of women. We do talk about violence against women, uh, human trafficking, sexual violence, but we also like to create a platform where we can talk about the incredible work that women are doing in our community, women in leadership and in decision making. So again, we're very thankful that you joined us today. Before we begin, we do want to recognize and thank our Indigenous partners for allowing us to share in this space. We thank you for the culture, the history, and really just uh, letting us uh, take part and really to learn from you. And so we thank you so, so much. So today I am thrilled to welcome my guest, Lindsay Danko. And Lindsay and I have known each other for a very, very long time. And Lindy, Lindsay is a wonderful woman who does great work in our community. And so I'm really, really thrilled to talk to her today and the work that she does as a social worker. And the nature of our conversation today is that we really do want to highlight that uh, CMHA May 2nd to 8th is Mental Health Awareness Week. So we really want to dive into the complexities of mental health that so many of us can struggle with and just what the supports and services look like. And so without further ado, welcome, Lindsay. I'm so glad you're with me today. It's great to talk with you. Oh, thanks for having me, Teresa. It's so nice to be able to have an opportunity to share the work that's being done in the community right now, because there are a lot of wonderful things happening. And thank you as well for uh, making special note of the upcoming Mental Health Week Awareness Week with CMHA. It's very important that we continue to um, uh, advertise that these supports are available and obviously trying to uh, decrease the stigma around mental health awareness. So let's dive right in, Lynn. So talk to us about the work that you do in the community as a social worker with Closing the Gap. So I work for a private uh, home care company. So my role is to provide social work services in home to clients who have been referred through uh, home and community care, which is formerly known as um, the North Simcoe Muskoka Lens. So we've had a, a recent name change just so that people are aware that it's still the same service, just under a different name now. Um, so some of the work that I have been doing in the community for some time now involves um, helping people connect to community resources, such as housing, helping people with finances. Um, I do some end of life work, lots of funding applications, and then of course, supporting people around um, mental health and, and supporting good mental health as well. So we know that so many folks in our community um, are challenged with mental health issues and also that there's an intersection of substance use where that applies and certainly uh, our agency the women and children shelter we approach our services for women and their children with a trauma-informed lens and we um, whenever possible we are trying to implement harm reduction principles for people that we know that have mental health challenges and who need to use substances to be able to cope uh, with that. In your work that you do, are you seeing an intersection uh, with your clientele of trauma, mental health, and substance use? Can you, can you kind of unpack that for us a little bit? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So, I mean, that it's always a trifecta of a, of a bad storm, um, if you, if you know, if you can think of it like that. But uh, so many people that I'm working with right now are, they've been very disenfranchised for most of their lives. Um, a lot of uh, traumas related to family history, uh, sometimes abuse, um, reoccurring homelessness, um, as well as, you know, just trying to survive the day to day. 
Um, I think the pandemic has only intensified what we're seeing right now in the community and people are, are trying to survive and do what they can to cope. So absolutely the mental health, the trauma, the addiction piece, it, it's all woven together very tightly um, when we think about, you know, what folks are going through right now in the community. And so when you talk about the work that you do when you're meeting with clients, mm -hmm. how aware are the folks that you work with of the trauma that they've experienced? Do they, do they have an awareness of that? Are they open to talking about that? What does that look like? So I always like to start my conversations with, with a client, being where they're at, of course, and trying to be respectful of their experience and the history that they've had and where, how they've gotten to this place, because we know it wasn't just overnight. Um, and so, you know, thinking about the same model that you use at the shelter around harm re reduction, my goal is never to, to jump in and try to save people or to say, you can't be doing this, or you need to get help today, or, you know, you need to, to stop completely everything. I like to, to come in and find out what's been going on, you know, some of the history that's maybe led up to this moment where we're now seeing each other. And, um, and what is it truly that the person wants to work on? Sometimes the addiction piece doesn't even come into play till, you know, maybe the second, third, or even fourth time that I meet with a person. Um, and so I really let them lead me into what their goals are for service for themselves. And, and eventually we do get there. Um, and, and I'm sure we're going to talk about more of the supports that are available in the community, but, um, my approach is very gentle, very sensitive to where the person's at. And I find coming in that way as, as a starting point of, of a relationship with somebody um, does have this natural tendency for them to just open up on their own. So sometimes I'm not even having to ask the questions. They're just wanting to share after they realize that it's a safe place to do so. I think it's a wonderful support that you provide, Lindsay. And I think, uh, you know, if I can speak about kind of our experience here at the shelter is that we are supporting women who have been traumatized and there can be a lifelong trauma that they've experienced and use substances just to help them cope with that history that they, they carry. And quite often those women do not want to share their personal stories with us because uh, it's traumatizing. It is, uh, it brings up a historical piece for them that they've been hurt by people that were supposed to care for them. And they've been, let's say, burned by so many systems around them, the court system, sometimes, you know, families, police, whatever it may be, right? How do you go about building that trust relationship with folks so that they can feel free to open up and not feel judgment? Mm -hmm. Well, the first thing I always let people know is that there isn't any judgment when it comes to our time together. You are free to share or not share whatever it is that's comfortable for you. Um, and also to that there is no expectation that there has to be any immediate change, that there's an understanding there that, you know, we can't necessarily unravel 20 or 30 or 40 or 50 years of trauma, but we can focus on where we're at right now. And what, what is it important to you today? What is it that you want to achieve? And, and again, you know, in this roundabout way, when you're supporting people around other things like good mental health, um, finding appropriate and accessible housing, um, supporting people so that they have a livable income so that they can survive, then sometimes the addiction piece, you know, once they get to those pieces of it, then there's a natural progression to wanting to work on the other areas of their life that have, have you know, been seriously impacted by the trauma that they've had to endure. And so can you just talk briefly about how does mental health and addiction, let's say, impact people's ability to, let's say, find housing or find employment? Like, how does that become a barrier to them? Well, it's a huge barrier. Um, first of all, I think one of the, the, the biggest pieces is being able to communicate effectively. A lot of times people are struggling with depression, severe anxiety, panic, uh, PTSD, which is post-traumatic stress disorder. So oftentimes they often feel immobilized 
by some of these emotions that they're experiencing. So even just to make a phone call or to try to find an application to apply for housing, things that may seem simple um, can really be huge mountains that, that people have to try to overcome as a starting point. Um, Again, I, I look at, I work with people who are very financially limited, so not being able to have access to a working phone, maybe the internet, or even just, you know, being able to mo like mobilize, get themselves out into the community can all really be huge barriers into um, a person being successful um, in the community. And I should imagine eat like you mentioned having a phone. I mean, most of us have a cell phone. Sometimes people have more than one, you know, a work phone, a home phone, a cell phone, right? Uh, or how do you apply for uh, employment if you have no fixed address? You have, uh, you know, no clothes to wear for an interview. You have no means to create a resume. Like, I, I just think it is so important for our listeners to understand the complexities and the challenges that folks who have limited income, who may be trying to um, uh, work with the mental health uh, challenges that they're experiencing and the addictions uh, issues that they may have, how they try to create a life and movement uh, with all those things, I think I should imagine, can be feeling very defeating for them. And on top of that, and I'd love to hear your, your kind of quick comment on this, is the judgment that people feel from their family members, just the community at large. Yeah. Uh, just talk to us a little bit about that. Like, what, what do you think people's experiences are in terms of how they describe the judgment and shame that they feel just for themselves and where they're at in their life. Yeah. Oh, I, I mean, I see it all the time. People feel embarrassed. People feel guilty for what's happening to them or what has happened. Um, and I, I think the biggest part then is a lot of people don't have hope anymore. They, because they've been burned so many times from different systems, people, families. Um, and so that's, that's something that I try to create in my work is a bit of hope to let the person know that they truly are not alone, that even if it's just one person reaching out and caring and trying to support them, that that means something. Nobody grows up wanting to be addicted. Nobody grows up wanting to be homeless um, or struggling every day to find food and, and to panhandle on the street. So I, I try to look at each person, each client as that, as that person with so much potential and there's so much hope for the future um, if there is an opportunity for them to open up and, and, and allow us to work together in that realm. And I'm sure uh, that you would agree. Um, you know, I've worked with many clients who've had some significant mental health needs and uh, in the throes of addiction and loveliest people that I've ever worked with. And it was humbling and an honor to work with them. And so, um, and you know, we look at trauma in terms of not what the person is doing, their actions or behavior, but what has happened to them that is causing them to act in that certain way. And so we are going to dive in deep and we really encourage our listeners to stay with us again. We're gonna just take a short break and we will be right back. This program is brought to you by Ignite TV. Now you're in command. Visit rogers.com for more details. It's about sharing and caring. It's about doing and belonging. It's about living life to its fullest. And it's about laughing out loud. We are L'Arche Canada, and we're about witnessing and sharing the gifts of all people. Learn more about us today. On the next Veracity. Justice. That was all we were looking for. A night of rage that still torments our city. This was going to come back and haunt us. Young Street Uprising. From your Sunday at 10, 9 central on City TV.
Welcome back to Educate, Inform, and Challenging. We're having a great discussion with my friend, Lindsay Danko, who is a social worker with Closing the Gap. And we're talking about and focusing on uh, the work that she does in supporting folks who have some mental health needs and who may also use substances to cope. And so we're really glad that you're with us for this conversation because we know the judgment and shame that so many folks who have experienced trauma can experience and um, they're living very difficult lives and they know and sense and feel and hear the judgment that can come their way from their families and folks in the community and we understand the difficulty in understanding why people do what it is that they do and so we're really trying to take a trauma-informed lens to that today. So Lindsay welcome back and we're going to dive right back in. So I would like to know as a social worker and you are you talked brilliantly about just being where people were at and letting them direct the supports and services that you provide and that you go along that journey with them. How do you help people to navigate their mental health needs and substance use? Mm -hmm. Well, I always like to um, create a circle of supports around a person. So one of the, the biggest things that actually may not seem so big, but it is for a lot of people is being able to connect with people they trust. And so oftentimes I will utilize the supports of other healthcare providers that are already involved. So the person may already have some case management support, maybe from CMHA, um, their doctor may be already quite involved with helping with get, getting them connected as well to the appropriate services, whether that's psychiatry or you know, further counseling. Um, and you know, there oftentimes there will be some family, or there'll be some friends, or even a supportive neighbor or a landlord who wants to reach out and also offer some kind of, of support. Um, and so we, you know, we, we don't work in silos. I, I really believe that it does take a community um, to to uplift and and support uh, the people that we're we're seeing. And so I, you know. I don't, I don't like to go into this alone. Um, so if we can create a bit of a network around that person uh, as a bit of a safety net while they're going through what they're going through, then I, I find that the chances of them being successful um, really increases. And I just want to ask you, kind of, we were talking about housing a little bit before, but if someone has um, vicarious housing, uh, you know, and let's say that they're, not every model fits every person for what they need. And we, there might be people that move around a lot or decide that they want to live in a tent. You know, mm -hmm. those are all options and decisions that people can make for themselves. How do you navigate that? Like, do you have experiences where you lose a person and you don't know where they've gone? Oh, yes, absolutely. Um, so we try really hard to stay connected, obviously, with my clients, but for people who are a bit more transient um, or are using the shelter system, for example, um, it can be a little bit more challenging. But oftentimes, again, going back to utilizing the supports of, the, of other um, uh, agencies and people that they're already working with, I usually am able to stay connected um, through those relationships and being able to find people. There have been times where I've driven around just looking for someone on the street because I know kind of where they, they, you know, their common hangout places are. And so I've been able to connect with people that way. I'll, I'll, I don't go into the tents, but if that's where you're living, if we can find somewhere to meet on a park bench or in a Tim Hortons, you know, again, it really is a meeting where people are at. And I find if you can just create that relationship in the beginning, it really isn't hard for people to invite you back. And they're pretty easy to find when you when they know they're going to get some help. And would it be fair for me to say that you may be one of the key consistent people in your clients' lives? That maybe they've been unfortunate from that, family. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, that can be true. Um, there's a lot of lonely people. There's a lot of people that have had horrendous lives and they don't they, they don't have anybody anymore for whatever for a variety of different reasons. So it, it is an honor that they're even able to open up and trust me, even if it's just for a couple of visits, even if it's just until, you know, we get through the one crisis that they're, they're trying to resolve. Um, 
yeah, it, it you know, it, it does take some time and it does take, you know, a certain way of communicating with people. But um, I, I think it comes down to respect and honoring who that person is and where they're at. And sometimes the work can be really easy if you can just reach that point at, at the very beginning. I, I just love hearing you talk about how you do your craft, how you support people, because it is with the utmost respect. Even, and you know, you can speak to this. I'm sure that you work with some clients that make decisions that you wish that they didn't make that are more riskier or uh, wouldn't be decisions that you and I would make, right? But how do you reason that in your in your work with them? Yeah, well, everybody has the right to self-determination um, and that includes making choices as long as they're informed about the types of risks that might be associated with what they're doing. Um, you know, it's not my job to, to chastise them or tell them this is how you should live your life. Um, but just understanding that, you know, a might lead to B, which might lead to C. And as long as you understand what it is that you're um, making a choice about, I will I will try to support that choice as long as I can, as long as it's in a, a safe way where I can still have a relationship with that person professionally. Have you ever felt, uh, like, would you say that frequently you feel unsafe when you're working with folks in the community or would that be rare? Um, that's a really interesting question because I do, I do actually get asked that a lot just because of the nature of my work. I do work alone, one-on-one um, -on -one with individuals and also, you know, in, in different areas of the community that may not be the nicest. Um, but I can say fairly confidently that I've never felt un unsafe to the point where I, I couldn't um, perform my job, perform my duties. Um, if there are ever cases, of course, where safety is a concern. My agency is wonderful at providing support, um, whether that's doing a joint visit with another therapist or providing the service in a different way, maybe over the phone, uh, if the person has that availability, if the home maybe isn't safe to go into. Um, but on the whole, I find that people are incredibly respectful of the work that I do. They give me the space to do the job. And even in some of those maybe less ideal situations there's always um i've always been welcomed in offered coffee you know just people want me to feel welcome just as i want them to feel welcome when we're doing the work together and i just think that is really key and very important for all of us to hear because you know we can see someone on the street who may look intoxicated or someone who may look like they are unhoused and there can be a fear mm -hmm. a fear of the unknown a fear of what is that person going to do you are stepping into those folks and their home environment whatever that may look like a hotel could be a hotel and for the majority of the time, you feel like you can work with that person and that they're respectful and even offering to make you a cup of tea or coffee. I think that for some folks who are listening and watching right now, that might feel contradictory for them, that they wouldn't think that that would be the case. And I think I just really appreciate that. And I just want to highlight that to know that there are some very incredibly nice people uh, who are struggling, struggling with their own mental health, struggling with addictions. But these are our family members. These are our neighbors. Uh, these could be our coworkers who are very nice people. And so I think just, again, trying to diminish the shame and that um, judgment is, is so key. We only have about five minutes left, Lindsay, and I know that there's so much we could talk about, but I, I want people to know how they can get in touch with you and what they could um, expect from you in terms of uh, services. So talk to us about what you can offer and how folks would find you. Um, so as far as my services specifically, so um, everything is referral based uh, through home and community care. 
anybody in the community can self-refer if they feel that they are in need or eligible for services. They do have to go through an intake process um, with home and community care to determine eligibility. Um, but from there, they get connected with a care coordinator who will review all of their needs, what it is that they're looking for. And from there, the referral um, then comes to, to myself and the other social workers in the community. Um, doctors can also refer uh, if there's concerned family members, they can also refer as well. Um, so that, uh, and this is all OHIP funded as well. So there's no, there's no fee for service. Um, it is absolutely all covered. And, and that's also a huge barrier uh, to overcome for people is that they can actually get service and get service fairly quickly um, without having to exchange any money. That's wonderful. Um, and so yeah. do they contact Closing the Gap? Do they contact you directly uh, or do they have to go through that coordinator person? They would have to go through home and community care um, specifically. Now we also do offer private therapy services as well through my agency, um, but that would be for somebody then who maybe has benefits or are able to afford the hourly rate. So if that were the case, then the person can go directly through my agency. And so when someone gets connected to you, you mentioned that they would go through, will they go through an intake process with you? And, uh, okay, and so start us off when they talk to you, you're going to come out for a visit with them or somewhere you're going to meet with them. And what is that first meeting going to entail? Um, so usually I will go through what the service is to make sure that the person understands what the work is that we're going to be doing together. Um, we sign all of our consents to share personal health information and any other person that they would like me to connect with during our time together. And then I get into a bit of an assessment, which sounds scary, but really all it is is just asking some questions just to kind of complete the story of, of who this person is and what kind of supports that they're requiring. We always agree on the goals of service together. So it's never me, you know, put, I, I give them ideas um, or I'll make suggestions, but ultimately it is the person that's receiving the service that agrees to the plan. And then we carry it out from there. And is there a time limit to how long you can work with people? There is. So unfortunately, the service is time limited. Um, we get a certain number of visits to go out to see somebody in the community. Um, but I find that, you know, after, you know, four, six, eight visits, um, that usually is enough time to get people connected uh, to make sure that they have what they need in order to hopefully carry on after I'm not there anymore and, and still have some type of success in the community. So, Lindsay, we're going to be wrapping up our conversation that has gone very, very quickly. And I know that there's so much more that we could talk about. But if there's someone who's listening today and maybe they're struggling, they're struggling with a relationship, they're struggling with some uh, mental health, addictions, uh, income, housing, vicarious housing, and you talked a lot about hope. What are your words of hope for that person that's listening right now? My words would be that we can always do something. There's no, we always have options. There's always a way, you know, we don't, um, we're, we're not necessarily going to fix the problem you know, in a matter of, of, of that time together or even after a couple of visits, but we are going to do things that are hopefully going to benefit the person long-term. So if they can have that little bit of trust in me, um, I always make that promise that we will accomplish great things together. Terrific. Thank you so much for being with us here today. And we hope to see you again next time. Take care. Bye-bye. <music>